check out the Unsuppressed podcast on Aftermath.media. Join Wes, Bill, Patrick, and Avery as they discuss the fundamentals of urban and wilderness survival, disaster preparedness, gear discussions, and so much more. Check it out with your premium Aftermath subscription and make sure you stay unsuppressed. If you're looking for a thought-provoking multimedia platform about current events, trending news, pop culture, conspiracies, and the paranormal, you need to sign up for Ground Zero's exclusive digital playground, Aftermath.media. Their website includes years of archived shows and podcasts from Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis and the Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable. Ladies, gentlemen, and hermaphrodites, my fellow slaves of the Global Plantation, the Vinnie Eastwood Show is bad news. It's like the news, but so much worse. It's the lighter side of genocide. Just because we're being exterminated doesn't mean we can't enjoy it. Otherwise, what's the point of being killed? The Vinny Eastwood Show, where the only thing worse than living in a high-tech global police state run by child-trafficking Satanists is Vinny's jokes. And my very special guest uh, joining me today is the uh, director of the uh, film uh, River of Freedom, which has been uh, making the rounds, actually uh, got uh, top ranked uh, among the most highly viewed movies at one point, and it is a... Basically, as far as I know, and I have not seen the film, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm coming in it as fresh as you are. If you have not seen it, uh, you can go to uh, the uh, website, which uh, Gaylene, which I'm sure, will uh, supply. Now, just before we uh, go to her, on the other hand, we have a little bit of housekeeping to undertake. The VinnieEastwoodShow.com. That's Vinnie with a Y, because it's the most important question. And Eastwood, like, go ahead, make my news. The VinnieEastwoodShow.com. If you go there, you can become a Patreon uh, of uh, the Vinnie Eastwood Show, and that will enable you to unlock and suggest uh, certain rewards that you would like from the show, as well as supporting it financially. And it has been going since I think this show started in 2010 on the American Freedom Radio Network, and of course since uh, 2007 uh, uh, till that 2010 period, I was a YouTube activist with more subscribers and. Uh, higher rankings than even New Zealand Herald TV, which is the largest New Zealand-based mainstream media entity at the time. We've had over 2,500 guests on the show from many countries around the world across hundreds of different disciplines and the archives are all available there on the Vinnie Eastwood show so at the top if you click on latest you will be able to search for basically any name any topic to a large degree and be able to come up with some information on that or listen to somebody who might inspire you this is the point of the show to stop listening to the show and if you're listening to it it's not a bad thing because we all need a little help we all need a little encouragement every hero has an inciting incident that makes them change what they are doing this is the meaning of the word controversy a fact that will make you change or make a choice in your life. That is what the Vinnie Eastwood Show is here to do. We want to motivate you. We want to say that all those things that you tell yourself, no, I can't do a podcast. No, I can't hold a protest. No, I can't make a documentary. Bullshit. Yes, you can. 
okay? Because you're better than most of the people out there who are making themselves a name in those fields. You are. It's not because you're superior or you were born that way. It's because you've worked on yourself. You've looked at the shadow side and you have accepted these dark parts of yourself. This makes you better than most people who have never braved those turbulent waters and gone through a dark night of the soul. Your knowledge, your wisdom is just as good as mine, if not better, and the world dies a little each day that your knowledge is not being shared with it. This is the obligation. So if you don't, if you don't do it, that's okay. Keep listening to the show, support the show. Maybe one day we'll have a guest on You'll be that one person who listens to that show, who stops what you're doing in your life and makes a change. That's the ideal that we strive towards. My very special guest, the director of River of Freedom, Gaylene Barnes. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for spending your time with us here. Hey, thanks. It's uh, great to be here with you, Vinny. I'm here in Kerwee in Canterbury. On um, my, I've got a self-sufficient blog. And I have to say, you know, what you've just been talking about, like during my 20s and 30s, it was my dream. I was working, I was had an urban farm and everything, and um, it was what I was working towards. And now I'm really happy. Here I am living living the dream. Got my sheep and chickens and ducks and cows and an edit suite where I make documentaries. Theodore Herzl uh, said, if you live it, it is no dream. So the film... River of Freedom, and if those of you who are watching on the YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook live streams, just go up and search Vinny Eastwood on those, find, find the channels please, if you can, tune into the broadcast live. The River of Freedom, and it has an upside down New Zealand flag, it has the Parliament Building, which was incidentally designed by a Freemason as the ideal Freemasonic society, where you have a queen in charge of all the drones, <laughs> and it's called the Beehive. Uh, uh, as and a bunch of uh, a very diverse, happy, interesting-looking people gathered around, and I made this point to you on the uh, phone before that when people talk about Wellington, they don't talk about the city Wellington in reference. They only talk about this protest. So could we please, I'm going to shut the hell up now for a moment and, and allow you to uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about who you are, what it is you do, and uh, how you came into uh, making this film, what the experience has been like, uh, both making it and releasing it, and the uh, acclaim uh, that you have received. Please uh, go, go for a long form answer, if you will. Okay, thank you. Um yeah, well, I am Gailene Barnes, and um, I've been a director and editor for 20, 30 years in Christchurch in Dunedin. I started my life as a potato farmer. Uh, I've got good peasant roots there, um, and then went to art school and learned how to use a computer. So that's how I got into the gig of um, making movies. Um, I was the only person in Dunedin that could use a computer, so that was a good skill to have. um it's a it's a good day to talk to you Vinny because obviously last yesterday was the COVID inquiry you know where we all had um, an opportunity to have a say about what our experiences are of the pandemic and um so I you know I've done a a lot of work with other people's stories and you know these films that I've made I've just made a Blu-ray as well. But it was a great opportunity for me to just actually talk about my personal experience and, you know, um, what I went through personally, which certainly wasn't as um, severe as some other people, including yourself, actually, you know, who were, who was imprisoned, like ridiculous. Um, and uh, I, I just was getting angrier and angrier um, as I was writing out my experience of... Um, Losing faith and losing trust in the government and the institutions, you know, which I trusted. So I, you know, I started off being quite um, left-wing and um, voted for Jacinda Ardern and 
in the first lockdown, I thought was, oh, well, you know, deadly virus, you know, maybe that's something we need to do. Um, and But there were inconsistencies. So I was just listing all those inconsistencies. And then as Delta arrived, I'd made a note in that thing that I should have resisted then because there were, resist, you know, there were these inconsistencies like asymptomatic and the COVID tracer app, um, which I deleted and the modeling didn't stack up and a man who died as a bullet from a bullet wound was listed as a COVID death, you know, so much, so much nonsense. And so I do respect you and what Billy TK were doing and all and Voices for Freedom who came in quite early and were able to, you know, trying to push back at it, at it. And, you know, some of us weren't perhaps listening as much as we could. And the, all you, the people that were opposing it were being called conspiracy theorists, as you know. Um, when it, even in the parliament, you know, Simon O'Connor and the National Party and, and others were opposing some of those measures, but that wasn't reported on. Yeah, so first of all, you lose trust in the government, and then you're losing trust in the media. Um, and then you're losing trust when things like Vaxathon came on and people were being um, encouraged to vaccinate um, by getting KFC, right? You know, and, oh, my God, the absurdities. Um, because is that for your health? I'm like, I'm going, where are the doctors? <laughs> Surely that is not what we should be encouraging. And I'm looking at the 1919 um, Spanish flu, you know, how they responded and the government of the day then were saying, open your windows, have some soup. <laughs> you know, they were actually telling people to be healthy and how to build your immunity up and, you know, do do normal things, which we would consider to be, you know, like just straightforward. And our government w wasn't doing that. And, and then the vaccination became um, their key central, um, uh, you know, their focus. And they actually legislated an act which put that central. And that's when, for me, it, I, it just flipped. And I think for a lot of people as well, because all of a sudden the unvaccinated were being scapegoated. And there was this, I, it still blows my mind, this sort of, um, the way they twist the language and they twist the, um, the, the wording, you know. So Aucklanders were locked up. You know, that was quite severe, that lockdown in Auckland. Well, you, you might have been in Auckland at the time and you were protesting that. Fair, fair call. I was telling friends, just go back to work, guys, honestly. just. But um, they had said that the, um, the reason you don't have your freedoms back is because me down in West Mountain isn't vaccinated. You know, it was like in order to get your freedom back, the whole country has to be vaccinated. And the only reason Aucklanders didn't have their freedom was because the government had taken it away. It's not because the government. You know, so number one absurdity. And then, of course, when the um, – I had a friend who had myocarditis who nearly died. I, you know, you have these things which, you know, the GMO vaccines really pissed me off because they're, the – Pfizer one is RMNA, but the um, AstraZeneca one was actually GMO. And as an organic farmer, I'm quite opposed to genetic engineering. And whenever in the legislation it says you have to have uh, public submissions on widespread release of GMO, and they had brought 2 million doses of AstraZeneca, which is listed as a GMO, um, genetically modified organism, and they hadn't done any safety or environmental, um, you know, like kind of measures around that. How is it going to be released in the environment? Like, does it hang around, you know? And I did read papers where it said there is potential risk for it to actually um, recombine if you're hanging out with a gorilla. <laughs> we don't have so many gorillas in New Zealand, but, yeah. Um, but you just... Yeah, so basically, and then Omicron came, and it was very, um, and then, yeah, the vaccine passed, and all the people um, of New Zealand, the society, accepted this um, discrimination and this um, ostracizing of the unvaccinated, and they they welcomed it, they attacked us further, and agreed with the ostracizing, 
and we were attacked personally. I was death wished by my family. My brother refused to see me um, and wouldn't let his kids see us. Um, my brother was told he his, the neighbour would chase him ar- around with a gun <laughs> if he didn't get vaccinated. <laughs> like, it got really crazy. And then um, because none of our farm actually had a vaccine pass, so we um, weren't able to uh, send our carrots to Auckland, our organic carrots. We couldn't get them into the market. And, um, you know, it just got pretty nuts. And then I was – so by the time I was totally fed up when the convoy was announced, okay, so we were coming to Parliament protests now. And what I've just said in, in my little um, inquiry form is, thank God for the convoy and for the Parliament protests. And, you know, I'm just like, thank God there are good people in New Zealand. And I love every one of those people who went on the convoy, who supported the convoy, who stood up at Parliament and and who, um, who just um, united. I mean, we were all from different belief systems and different um, came from different places. But we knew that it was wrong, and it is. It was an immoral, um, by the end of it, it was just an immoral, um, appalling attack on people's human rights. So I just made an instant decision to film the convoy. I mean, I've only got this tiny little camera here, if you can see it there. So I filmed the, um, but it's a good one. So I did film about 23% of, of River of Freedom, um, some of it on that camera. And then I got Mark Lapwood in, and he was also fed up. A lot of our filmmakers were fed up. So we all hooked up and got together at Parliament, and everyone was filming different things, and I um, I was always chasing characters and stories and all good audio, you know, interviews with people. Um, and we just captured a really important moment in time of New Zealanders, good people, standing up, you know, and... Yeah, so I, it really ha- hurts me when I hear, hear the media or the government still denigrating them. The worst thing to do is to listen to the March the Third speeches in Parliament where James Shaw of the Green Party and Marama Davidson and, uh, you know, Jacinda Ardern and all of them just spoke so, uh, di- you know, they were despicable, really, their behaviour towards Parliament, who, who were good New Zealand citizens, right? So we made a film. It took me. It's took, it taken me a good year and a half, and um, I, I, yeah, it's been a labour of love, and um, we've had some funding to sort of pay for extra camera and some colour grading and, you know, um, a few things. So I just really want to thank everybody who has supported the film and um, contributed because everyone's a part of it. Yeah. Just thinking about this concept, we have to really come to grips with is the as we were talking about uh, earlier before the show the cult and uh, uh, this is where we get the term culture and when we look at parliament in and of itself if we look at really the system of government comes from the latin governe uh, which means to control and mente meaning the mind so I think what happened here, uh, especially with the uh, River of Freedom film, the uh, the protest in, in Wellington, is it was basically an about face from a, a, a religious uh, point of view, a uh, an apostasy against the institution of uh, government in and of itself. And we had, I believe, a uh, almost a, a religious awakening uh, within that. And, and as I described, the military people who've gone through similar trauma, they have this sort of brotherhood. And uh, because I'm so uh, close-knit with the uh, freedom community just in general around the country, uh, I have seen this camaraderie between people who have been at the protest together. And uh, Billy TK and myself obviously couldn't go because that was... Uh, two thousand dollar fine and two years in prison instantly uh, if we uh, attended any protest action that was on our bail conditions uh so uh for myself i feel a you know i kind of felt left out 
you know, and 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 real and real kind of like sad about it when anybody ever really talks about Wellington. I was like, oh, you know, that, like like that uh, that 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 brutal feeling of FOMO. Oh. <laughs> well, look, I have to show you. See, this is a DVD, and in the, on in the DVD, this is oh, sorry, the Blu-ray, and in the Blu-ray, can you see that all this thing? Oh, all these little ribbons here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were from they were from people who um who couldn't be there but could send their love on a ribbon, which was hung on the, on the lines, mm. you know, so I, I, you were, were you were, if you were there in spirit, you were there. Well, I did help to do uh, some of the live streams and uh, um, uh, things of that nature, conducting interviews with people. I think I had uh, Brendan Carson uh, down there in Wellington, who I'm helping to set up a Freedom uh, New Zealand Freedom Radio, actually, at the moment. Um, he was in Wellington, and he says to me, Vinny, do you need a cameraman down there? And I said, is, is the Catholic Church a front for pedophilia and banking? Yes, of course, I need a cameraman down there. And uh, he didn't have any money like he run out of battery and 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 his phone wouldn't work or, or or something of that nature and i said to him bro you're at the parliament protest if you go around telling people that i'm in the alternative media and i need a battery pack so that i can continue filming uh, for a live stream people will donate you the money so that's exactly what he did it took him 18 minutes to raise the 200 that he needed for a new battery pack Cool. When you are doing what you're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing and you're yeah. doing it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. nothing can really stop you. And, and all you have to do is uh, is ask, you know. And yeah. I, I think what was particularly frustrating for me, anyway, was the fact that not a single elected parliamentarian had the courage to come out and speak to any of the protesters and what i've heard from people about the film there's 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 a great indignancy in the population of new zealand who went to that protest great indignancy yeah. and your film uh, i've spoken to i think maybe about five uh different uh people some of some of them uh close friends some of the, some of them uh, distant acquaintances uh but they all said more or less the same thing is they would go into that movie feeling empty and feeling alone and feeling undervalued, underappreciated and faithless. And they come out of the movie feeling full and validated like they found their tribe. And so regardless of uh, what we do, as artists, uh, I believe there's only really two things an artist really need do uh, in order to uh, have a, an accomplished feeling is to get a physical reaction from the audience, actually change something within them. That might be to make them laugh, it might be to make them cry, it might make them see something that they didn't really know was there, even if it was right in front of their face, and then suddenly their life is now uh, better and different. That's what people have told me mm. about your film. Mm. Um, yeah, I do approach filmmaking um, with a um, idea of, uh, with a deep consciousness of spirit and the potential of film to be spiritual. Um I don't want to say shaman is, but it's sort of like um, in a world where we need, where we have um, where images and music and voice have power in themselves and it really behoves us and I feel very responsible about it to make sure that that is honoured and um, that I'm not upsetting the spirit of the people, of the co-papa, of the um, what people were bringing, you know, the, uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, it's quite interesting at the end, um, of the film, you know, you might not notice it in a obvious way, but I sort of went back and, and chose a lot of images where people were using circles, uh, to, you know, like group circles and a woman 
who was um, using a hoop just to sort of send everybody out the door because for me, and then we talked right at the end about owning and not oh, remembering your sovereignty and your um, own space and then the space of the people and then, you know, the, 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 our wider planetary space. But, um, yeah, and, and a lovely Komata were talking about your essence in my essence because at the end of the day it really is back, comes back to our relationship with each other and the film is um, a mediation between people and those relationships. I mean, when in terms of the response of people, obviously when Jacinda turned up we had a lot of um, hisses and boos and angry um, voices <laughs> and when some other people popped up there was a lot of that it was quite interactive actually um, and I, I I was was a bit nervous about how the film would go down at the end where the people would feel you know like let's grab our pitchforks and rise and revolution and um, but I, that's not what I wanted because I actually don't believe believe that we want to um, create or push for revolution because I do think that's a very well it's very Marxist for a start because it's just endless revolutions is what controls us effectively so be going beyond that revolutionary spirit and into a um, connection um, and peace actually so uh, when at the end of it there was just peace and I think you're right people I because I wanted to validate people's experience and their beliefs and why, you know, their uh, work and, and protest. And um, it was, a, um, a, I, I was really happy with the response of the people and the quietness of it. This surprised me. Even from people who weren't part of the freedom movement who went, they don't say anything about it. You know, some, you know how you have other media or other things out there and they just blast it to bits? I haven't really had that being blasted to bits by, you know, the likes of Byron Clark, who I know went to say it, and um, a few others. They've just ignored it, which says something, I reckon. <laughs> if you're being ignored by Byron Clark, hats off to you, darling. All right, let's just... I mean, you dodged a bullet with that one. <laughs> You know, uh, You're, you guys used to be old friends, didn't you? Uh, and Occupy um, Christchurch. Uh, I, I'm afraid uh, I was never at Occupy Christchurch. Oh, you weren't. Oh. No, no. Occupy Auckland was. Uh, oh, uh, I think that that was my feeding ground. Uh, but I remember uh, this is the thing, and I hate to get real with people, and I hate to get real with you, but but it's it's how I got the gig. <clears throat> Occupy should have taught us something. Billy and my arrest should have taught us something. That chanting peace and love in the face of oppressive state violence and using tents against them ain't gonna work! Okay, it's it's a tried and tested, uh, tested and, tr and true method. Occupations always fail, and uh, th these lessons just simply uh, weren't learned because I I think there was a lack of respect. And I've spoken to I think a uh, former constable uh, Buck Rains about this. I think I believe he was uh, the most vocal. Maybe uh, Calvin Alp from uh, Counterspin Media uh, to a second degree. These are police trained and military trained guys. Uh, who, who understand how uh, the mechanism of, of government work. It's based on uh, the monopoly of force, more or less. And force is basically, in terms of the physics of it, it's just an entity. And when you use force against people for no reason other than you want to force them to do something, that's called violence, okay? It comes from the, the word violate, to take something that does not belong to you. And defensive force is the right of all sentient life. And it didn't seem that the protest understood that principle, that they had a right to defend themselves, and they, uh, I believe uh, Buck told me that when he tried to tell the people what the police have got, 
what their tactics are, where the choke points are, and all of the, these sort of things. A former police officer trying to tell them how to protect themselves and the protest and the movement from his former colleagues. He was ignored roundly, and people were just saying, no, nah, it's all about peace, it's all about freedom, everything's going to work out. But it didn't, mm. did it? And as well, a re- I think that actually um, proves that um, the conspiracy that they said that they were militant um, Nazis and white supremacists down there was a lie because most of the people down there had no idea about militant strategy and um, and that kind of, uh, even the security of, of the parliament and also picked. And, you know, there was issues around just basic security um, stuff. So um, the, the, it just wasn't in their scope of thinking is that sort of militant behavior and we, i actually talk about that in the film yeah. yeah like people they didn't get their heads together to work out a strategy they just let the police run over them there wasn't if you had have even just took, taken a few minutes to actually think about what the police were doing on the second march you would have realized oh we needed to actually go up the hill and just defend the hill at the top because that's when where all the people all the police were coming down and i i listened to another podcast that you you said you, you said uh, a couple of weeks ago, I thought it was hilarious. Actually, I laughed and laughed. <laughs> we said that we only need two billion dollars to buy the police force. Was it two billion or four? Yeah, billion? approximately two billion. Yeah. Yeah, and then we were going to start a crowdfunding. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about that because I've been thinking, man, you are so right. That is, how easy is that to take over a country? You know. Like some thugs with a couple of billion can come in and buy up New Zealand, right? So, I mean, we do, of course, have to protect ourselves from that and, and protect ourselves from that kind of force taking too much control. But then, okay, so you've got your your police and your um, your force, but who? What, what are the laws and the rules that they are behoven to? So, you know, that's the second stage that, you know, you have to sort of think about. And that's what apparently the parliament's supposed to be doing is – you know, and they're supposed to be doing that with consent of people, you know. <laughs> but as we can see, they've been making very bad laws and policies that are affecting people and making people suffer. And you are quite right that, um, you know, they did not come out and meet the protesters. It was completely cynical that three weeks afterwards they went and dropped the um, uh, man, some of the mandates. You know, like they could have just, look, why? Why not just say we're going to do that in three weeks? Yes, you're right, guys. It's a wee bit over the top, you know, like calm down. Let's all calm down. It's all going to end. Um, go home. <laughs> but, I, you know, because most people were there because they had lost their jobs. It is amazing how many people love their jobs and were ready to fight for their jobs, okay? The right to work um, because work do- is – Work is joy. I love work. I'm a I'm a workaholic, and so I I I, I really respect that. Um, yeah. So it was just it's a despicable contempt for New Zealand citizens that suffered under their policies, and they all need to be held to account. Absolutely, and that um, re- that um, review thing, whatever that COVID inquiry, it, it hopefully it, no, it better do that because I don't want to see revolution, and and I and I know that you. I, I don't agree with the idea that we need to um, get militant about it because it's it's just a loop. Because then who's next in charge? You know, like well, that, that was the thing somebody actually said to me uh, the other day is um, that's why she doesn't uh, support the uh, the freedom movement because if they get themselves in charge, uh, uh, things will just be made worse. Apparently, they believe that it'll be worse than uh, ultra intergenerational wealth families with a cadre of child trafficking Satanists who run and control all money and power bases in the world. They, they, they think that we do a worse job than them right <laughs> and i i find that utterly ridiculous uh, 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 even even the thought of it if you if you really uh, uh, follow the logic train on it now the, the question is uh, if you make what was it gandhi said he said if you make peaceful revolution impossible you make violent revolution inevitable now there's a, a game theory uh, being played on uh, basically the whole uh, kind of mankind and I, I got bullied a lot as a child so i, I i've seen this you know firsthand you ever had somebody like pushing you you know, come 
on, come on, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, and that's that's when you hit them back, boom, and then the bully stops bullying you because he realizes you're somebody who he doesn't, uh, he's not capable of messing with without consequence. They mm. want they want easy victimhood uh, yeah. to a large yeah, well, that's degree. That, that, that's, yeah, that's that victim, victimizer. I mean, that's definitely something that uh, needs addressed because, yeah, people too fall, easily fall into the victim mode. And um, does it take a one punch? Uh, who knows? But yeah, um, we've got uh, and, and we are and we are, ladies and gentlemen, talking about figurative punches in the face. <laughs> I, 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 I must, I must, take that out of context. I must, I must stress this: we we are not encouraging the uh, uh, the the violent no. upheaval of of the ruthless criminal sociopathic scumbaggery that beset us. No, uh, so so sorry, Gail, Gail, please continue. <laughs> Well, one of the things I researched, and it wasn't in the film, but it was what the police had, were planning to do, which was so much worse than what they actually did, okay? Um, so they had imported these really full-on MK60 pepper spray guns, yeah, which spray gel 30 metres and in 30-second bursts, like full-on, like great big soda stream things that just, you know, like broad spectrum spray people so they had ordered 12 of those in on the airplane at great expense twenty thousand dollars just for freight from a company in the u.s um as well as a whole bunch of you know larger pepper spray um because of a snowstorm in the u.s god something um, and various other things those um devices didn't arrive in time for the second of march planned ambush they had been planning that ambush since the 14th of February. So they were just playing it cool, you know, la la la. You know, easiness, down, easiness, smoothing it all out, ready for the big push. So um, those weapons, I did put it in the Blu ray, but I forgot to sort of put this note that the, uh, the um, Organization for the Prohibition of, of Chemical Weapons is actually looking to ban them for use in riot control. Riot control on civilians because they are so um dangerous yeah and of course they don't have permission to use them in new zealand so i don't know what they're thinking bringing them in anyway well, I, that, that brings me to another point, actually, is uh, that the vast majority of people, even people in the freedom movement, don't know who we're dealing with, don't know what they will do, don't know the tricks that they've got up their sleeves, and don't know the exotic technologies that they have at their disposal that they will bring out if they feel threatened. You know, that's, mm, the, that's but only if you give them consent to do that. Oh, I, I, I disagree. I think I think w what happens is uh, consent becomes a trap. I think, and when people stop consenting, then they will often experience the uh, direct consequences of their non-compliance. This goes back to the Milgram experiment, where they had somebody being electrocuted in in some cases to death. You know, a play actor. You know, pretending to be dead. Uh, and the the reason why they did that experiment is because they were confused at how the most advanced Western country in the world, in, in uh, World War Two Germany uh, at, at that time, uh, culturally, technologically, uh, how could they get all of their people to do such horrible uh, uh, things and convince an entire population that there was a threat so bad that they needed to abandon all their freedoms and all their morals uh, in order to uh, 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 taper that threat that they, they called the Jews at the time. And so the experiment was that you've got a guy in a white lab coat, right, authority figure. He's from Harvard University, as about as authority as authority gets. And they found that 90% of people, just because an authority figure told them, would mm. kill somebody else with, mm. with, with electric shocks. That's scary, isn't it? That's, I mean, that is, but when I, when I say consent, it's your own personal consent. You know, and it's, as you say, it's about knowing your own mind, all right? And, and having a very strong sense of your own morals and who you are. And if everyone was to do that, oh, the world would be just utopia. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say, if, if we didn't give away our sovereignty and our authority to someone else. Mm. like, And I talk about that in the film too, in fact. Um, one of my characters says that, and I'm going, thank you for saying that, because yeah, that's great. Yeah. like we, And so it's about if we take it back, and then we can show people how to do it, how to be sovereign in yourself, 
how to know your own mind. How because as you as you say, these authority figures or anything, culture, they tell us things. You know, they they tell us this and this belief, and you know, even you have some beliefs. You know, you go, oh, this 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 is right, whatever. Maybe it's not. You know, you have to test it. You have to check it out with your own truth in your own body in your own mind. And um, so, like for me, about five or six years ago, I just took everything to zero. I abandoned all beliefs, and um, and I just said, right, I'm over it all. Don't believe in God. I was Christian-ish at the time, and I said, right, it's all gone. No, nope, don't believe in God. Don't believe this. Da, da, da. <laughs> and just wanted to wait and see what popped up, you know, what, and I think, and then I realized it's actually a process you have to do every day. You have to sort of take it to zero um, and, and then just test it out because every day changes and uh, I, I don't know, they call mind swipes or, you know, like mind, um, we do get infested with mind viruses and it can happen to groups. Of people, obviously, we've seen this happen to our whole society. It was a mind virus. Um, so, the, I mean, honestly, the best advice I can give is just know your own mind and really be strong in it. And um, but be also be prepared to be flexible with any strongly held beliefs because that leads can lead to extremism in your thinking. And yeah. Oh, I agree with all of those uh, points you've made there. And to uh, back that up, I was trying to make it an adjacent point as well, because uh, the prison experiment had a second part of the experiment, which is not quite as widely known as the first part, where they took that 10% of people who refused to deliver those electric shocks to the next people in the experiment. And they found that when somebody is shown to have courage, wow. when somebody is shown to stand mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. do so successfully, close to 100% of the next people coming into the experiment would also refuse. This is why the protesters had to be so brutally uh, 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 assaulted with a mailed fist of authority because I believe if they had the uh, presence of mind, they would have come up with a third part of the experiment. That if uh, some that if somebody refused, they got bashed over the head. <laughs> it would have made everybody else go, "Oh, uh, maybe I won't refuse as well." See, that's the thing: you can't get away in this country with being seen to be free, with being seen to be sovereign, and just get away with it. That's why they don't report on your film perhaps as much as they should, if at all. That's why they don't mention so many things, because they want to prevent any of that encouragement. It comes from the word to give courage. Mm. That's the thing. Courage is also a virus and one that needs to be eradicated from society if those who wish for mankind to remain perpetually without hope and therefore easily controlled. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was quite surprising how easily people were controlled um, into doing quite immoral things, yeah. That was very disappointing. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I, you know, you think New Zealand's a free country and... And, and just the attacks that are continuing now. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. People might consider me, because, you know, I was pretty left-wing, quite greeny. I'm still greeny, but would never vote for the Green Party again. They were very, I, I was quite delusional, really, right right up to the parliament. I actually spoke to Tiano Tui Ono, one of the Green Party MPs at parliament. Come down, I said. Come and talk to us. We're all organic here, you know. <laughs> I can get a whole group of organic farmers together. <laughs> tell them about it. Why, you know, you, and you, you wouldn't it be amazing? You'd be the only one parliamentarian to come down and talk to us. What a coup for you! And he says, "Oh, look, okay, look, I'll see. I'll ask the boss, James, and I'll get back to you on Tuesday." And so I was actually going to leave that weekend, and I thought, "Oh, bum, I have to wait now." <laughs> Slept another few days on the in the tent. Uh, and then the day that he was going to come down was obviously the first day. Um, yeah, 
Parliament sitting again on Tuesday, and that's when the um, police came through. So obviously, I didn't hear back from him. He didn't give me the message that, oh, no, I'm not going to come and see you because actually the police are about to, you know, bash you up. <laughs> and so honestly, the, and then the Green Party had the ball, had the audacity, sorry, to say um, that we were all white supremacists and Nazis and, um, yeah. And so I have not been, you know, they say, oh, I've been online radicalised into the right wing. I don't feel that. I kind of feel I've been normalised. <laughs> and um, I'm now able to look. I don't feel I'm right wing or left wing. I'm feeling in a very interesting position where I can look at the um, the mind viruses in both camps, really. Yeah. This is uh, I, something I like... Uh, my own mind virus that I had when I was left wing too. Well, well this is something uh, uh, somebody called me. They said, uh, Vinny, you're disillusioned. Uh, you sound disillusioned and I looked up the definition and it's when you're no longer operating under a delusion mm -hmm. I am totally disillusioned <laughs> it's, and it, do, it doesn't give me any um, I'm not unhappy about it it just actually gives me a lot of peace and joy I'm like oh okay I can see that now quite clearly that's great yeah, we, we tell ourselves a lot, a lot of lies and we get lied to uh, uh, quite a lot. And upon the revelation of those lies and the realignment of our lives, as it were, then the kind of thing happens that all human beings are supposed to experience. A feeling of purposefulness, right? I, I think what's happened uh, significantly through the uh, de successive decades of uh, dumbing down of uh, education, uh, social engineering, propaganda through uh, the media and entertainment industry, it has basically corralled human consciousness into this vein where questioning uh, the self, looking inside is not seen as a priority because the system is predicated upon you fitting into where you're supposed to fit in the hierarchy and if you start to believe that there is no th such thing as a hierarchy that I'm an entrepreneur that I can come up with ideas that nobody's ever thought of I can do things that nobody's ever done and do it better than anybody it threatens the very control fabric of society and this is why they give people ADHD medication oh you can't sit still oh you're highly creative Oh, you've got lots of energy. There's something wrong with you. Let's <laughs> let's drop. Let's 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 give you watered down cocaine. All right, like like, bro, you you you, you need help, son. No, all right. No, no, no. Honestly, we need to be listening to those people. They're prophets. We're we're at prophets, right? Oh, we're all on drugs. Dang. Well, I mean, they, they, I believe yeah. it, uh, that's why they call them uh, drug company prophets, personally. But, but, <laughs> that's right. but, but the the yeah. Well, do you know what they, those people are called? They're called artists. Yeah, yeah. and that's yeah, because that's what I've always been. I like I've never had a job. <laughs> I'm just, I just I've tried to have jobs, but no one gives me jobs like you know proper salary jobs. <laughs> so I've always sort of lived on the edge with you know a bit of this contract to that contract, and you know just always had the ability to sort of do whatever I like and think whatever I like and, you know, as an artist because, I, you know, I do some you know, drawings and stuff as well and and I, in that space, I have complete freedom to take my mind and, and the mind of the audience wherever I like, you know, like, and just explore these realms, you know, like I do a lot of sacred art so I'm exploring realms of the connection between the cosmos and the microcosm and, you know, that was my last exhibition that I did that and, um, and no one questions you in, those, in that space of being an artist because that's their job is to be, you know, sort of arrow point, you know, where, is to not restrict our minds and our creative energies. Yeah. So, uh, but maybe some artists don't work in that way and there is a bit of a, because some of it's become quite identity and culture driven rather than free thought. Yeah. Well, I don't know. So I'm not. I'm probably not a real artist in that sense, <laughs> but I'm just an artist in my own mind. <laughs> well, my my music producer told me that all artists, all good artists, he, he specified, are broken people. You know, yeah. pe people yeah. who've who've seen and felt and experienced uh, things that are not pleasant, 
and as a result of that unpleasantness they wish to counteract it by bringing something that is good, that is joyful, that is therapeutic into the world. And I said for a long time about the difference between a, uh, a bad politician and a, and a good activist is that one of them, the activist, will see and experience trauma uh, uh, from a group of people or an institution and they therefore devote their lives to trying to prevent that same kind of trauma happening to other people from those groups and uh, individuals. The bad politician, on the other hand, and there are good politicians, uh, theoretically. I'm not sure if I've never met any, but, but anyway, I, but I digress. Uh, the, the, the bad politician says, I've been hurt, and so I can hurt anybody for any amount of time and be infinitely justified because I've been hurt and nobody was there for me and so nobody's going to be there for you right that's the difference between uh, the light and the dark everything has polarity men women black white and this concept that we uh, uh, come into view here I think is basically we haven't got the ability to understand the uh, the microcosm and the macrocosm uh, uh, of our own uh, place in the universe and mm. I, di- I didn't either until uh, one day I was sitting around with my band and uh, uh, my mate Barack was explaining to me what an antioxidant is and he go, what, what do they do well it turns out that machines and humans die for the same reason. We oxidize, we rust slowly, and this is caused by these little entities called free radicals. So this is this is how it works on the micro scale. So you've got a cell, beautiful, healthy, uh, 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 and full of life, full of creativity, and he's and he's going through the bloodstream, and along comes one of these free radicals, and he he says to you in a sinister voice, "Hey, buddy, you're oh, you're so talented, oh, you're so beautiful, you could be a really big star." Hey. It looks like you've got some spare electrons there. Do you mind if I just snatch them off you? And then all of a sudden this... <laughs> should be a science teacher. And, and, and this cell is now, is now uh, uh, broken. He's, he's damaged. Um, and and he's, he's traumatized, you know. He, he's, floating, he's floating through the arteries. <laughs> <laughs> and, and... But then... There's these other entities that are different to the free radicals. Instead of taking electrons and causing oxidation, they carry spare electrons with them. And he sees this little cell crying. (laughs) He goes, oh, buddy, what happened to you? He goes, well, there was this guy and I thought he had my friend. and, And he... He, he took my electrons. <laughs> oh, buddy, it's okay. It's all right. Look, I've got some spare electrons here. You can have them, all right? Go, <laughs> really? Yeah, mate. Oh, what? oh, my God, you just, like, restored my faith in humanity. <laughs> How can I ever repay you? Sell animacy. <laughs> and... The antioxidant says, you'll never have to. From the micro to the macro, from the free radical to the antioxidants, to the activist and the psychopath, we all are involved in some little game. Those who are warriors doesn't mean what people think it means. It's not to go out and seek war. Warriors are those who seek the defenseless, who seek the powerless, and seek to protect them. Nice. 
So, yeah. So the, the moral of the story is be an antioxidant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we prevent people from dying, you know, in, in, in actually a, quite a literal way. Um, and I think the I, one of my primary methods of therapeutizing people is just to listen to them. Um, uh-huh. but, but not just listen. I've got this dial, and usually if I watch a movie or something like that, I, I turn my dials up, all right? So if there's any emotion there, if there's any comedy there, I've got my dials up so that I can receive it in, in fully, as, as the filmmaker intended. And the same thing I like to do for uh, uh, conversations with people, particularly at parties when they're a little bit inebriated, so that uh, some of their defenses are down, when nobody's really listened to them before. N- nobody's really listened yeah. and taken on board that emotion and mm-hmm. reacted to it. You yeah. can sit there uh, for an hour, two hours, having a conversation with somebody, and you can relieve years and decades worth of trauma, oh, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, 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 narrative therapy, whatever. But yeah, I mean, as a as a filmmaker, a documentary maker, I've always, you know, we we go in and we talk to people, and we listen. We have, I'm going to I'm going to hear from you for two hours, and I've always felt that it has been quite therapeutic um, because I have no, I don't come with any agenda. You know, I'm not coming to try and heal you. I'm not, you know, like a therapist or you know to look for those little places we we can tweak or whatever. Not doing that, just blank camera blank wall just tell us your stuff (laughs) just you know let it all out and just tell us stuff and it is it is um a really privileged position because of that yeah it's we're healers i i I think and uh native americans have this uh uh, story they uh, had a guy who was uh, so badly wounded that he didn't feel like he'd ever get back his mobility he didn't think he'd ever recover and he he, as a result he he didn't want to live and the story is about uh the wounded healer the only person who was able to talk him out of his funk the only person who was able to uh let him deal with what happened to him and uh, go to the next stage in his life was somebody who had suffered similar wounds and had made their own way back. Mm. Mm. So this is where we find ourselves uh, now. Actually, uh, we are in, we are moments away from the very end of, of the broadcast, unless we want to do another hour. But before we do that, I'm going to need to go take a wiki leak. So we're going to uh, switch to the uh, ad breaks for just a moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, while Gaylene and I uh, uh, refresh ourselves and we'll come back and uh, close up the show in just a few minutes, folks. You're listening to The Vinnie Eastwood Show at thevinnieeastwoodshow.com. That's Vinnie with a Y because it's the most important question. And Eastwood, like, go ahead make my news go there and and donate today if you can ladies and gentlemen we'll be back with Gaylene Barnes the director of the River of Freedom in just a few moments
And we're back. So sorry about that, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, like Julian Assange, I also occasionally need to take a wiki leak. Now, we... We're... 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 we're, we're, we're we're rounding off the uh, 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 broadcast here uh, with Gay Lamb Bars. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, reserve a, a small portion of the show uh, for my guests so that they can uh, engage in, in what could be uh, derided as shameless self-promotion. But uh, the reality is it is advertising in the marketplace of ideas and spirit. So, Gaylene, please, if you will, uh, give us a little bit of a breakdown of where people can uh, get the film. Any other things that you, that you uh, wish to promote? Have you got an exhibition going up? Re- regardless, uh, th- there's there's practically no rules apart from uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, not uh, uh, swearing. I th- I think of, are we allowed to swear on this network? I certainly fucking hope so. Anyway, go, go ahead, Gaylene. Yeah. Well, thank you. I can, I'm sure you can see I'm quite shameless, like, River of Freedom, yeah, River of Freedom, yeah. So you can get these, t- these sweatshirts, you know, I've got Mallard Duck there. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been pretty, having a great time with our merch. We love it. Um, but also, obviously, the, the, uh, the Blu-ray is for sale at the moment. I've just made these. They are fantastic. We've got 15 extra scenes in this here with uh, some really great stuff. We are, um, one of my favorite scenes that couldn't get in the movie, we, are, we go to a, a follow a team going to the uh, art gallery. Couldn't get in because they didn't have a vaccine pass and the police they sent the police out on them. Bunch of lovely ladies. Yeah, sent the police. Anyway. So here's this and here's the DVD as well, which um please people be patient. It's just hopefully it's been sent today from Australia and it'll get here soon and I'll be able to send this out. I've already had hundred and twenty people purchase one of these. So these are they're still more available. I'm thinking I might do a bit of a limited edition of these. Anyway, so that's the um the DVD. Of course it's still online. Yeah. So you can go and watch it on YouTube. Um, Vimeo, and we have a distributor in London who's put it everywhere, you know. He's, it's a official distribution of a film. Yeah, it's been great. So you can go to riveroffreedom.nz to um, watch that film. And I'm, I'm just going to promote the film. Yeah, I've got a few other projects, but we can talk about that maybe next time. <laughs> All right, riveroffreedom.nz is the website. I'm actually, I want to pull pull that up here uh, so that people will know from I have it here actually on if I share the screen. Oh, uh, don't don't worry. I've uh, oh, okay. I've got it covered. Oh my god, I've got riveroflies.co.nz up up there. <laughs> uh, where are we? Where are we? You'll have to uh, forgive me one moment. I have not eaten and I have not slept and yet still I'm here fighting for freedom. And you do well, man. You know, I I Sometimes we tell ourselves lies. I try not to tell myself lies. I'm just the best. Now, <laughs> with, yeah. <laughs> yeah, River of Free- Freedom dot NZ, and um, on. I mean, well, to be honest, we really need someone who's good at WordPress <laughs> to help me with the website. It's not the most brilliant website, but on the front page, we just have all of the. Um, yeah, uh, all of the. Okay. Well, uh, so that's how you can buy it, and also all the online. So we've got Apple TV, YouTube, Amazon, Vimeo on Demand, Google Play. Um, in different territories, it's sort of quite different. So I don't. Are your, if your audience is in the USA, probably Amazon might be the best. And we had this little film down here was a wee mini documentary we made about the um, the cinema release in New Zealand. It's quite interesting to watch. Now in. When we're talking about this uh, uh, film here, I mean, we're talking about a great reception. Now, uh, for documentaries, they, they work uh, differently on terms of uh, a budget over, over ratio uh, in terms of what it needs to be a success, right? And in Hollywood, you need 2.5 times what your initial budget was in order for it to be qualified as to just break even. Uh, did, you, <laughs> did, you, did you break even on this one? Uh, pro, well, uh, um, so uh, it did 
four hundred thousand dollars in the box office, but we only got a proportion of that, about one hundred sixty thousand, and we got one hundred sixty thousand donations. So we probably did a hundred, you know, like even. Um, of course, all of that money was used to um, pay bills. Like we had um, bills, we had to pay the um, the de- per- people who put out the DCP and all the marketing and. Um, yeah, so we, but in, in terms of a documentary in New Zealand, we did extremely well because that is rare. Like, the, often you, a film will be funded two million or one million, and it will only do about forty or fifty thousand at the box office. <laughs> <laughs> so even the fact that we did four hundred thousand dollars for a documentary is actually extraordinary. Yeah, and that hasn't been really reported on much either at all. Not even in the industry. Yeah. Well, so I'm really very proud of the success of the film. You've you've actually struck a chord. I, I I think it's what you might call a an important part of our history. Uh, this is something that actually uh, Hollywood is adept at is is making these historical uh, uh, epics and and things of that nature to tell people what the version of history was uh, uh, from that time, and you've done it in documentary form so it's not just uh, uh, something that's entertaining it's not just something that makes you uh, feel something as entertainment is supposed to do it's something that's wholly real that resonated with people and it's uh, the truth is a frequency they Mm. say They, they say everything is frequency mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh you you seem to have gotten that uh that vibration up to that that, that level where um, what was that old saying never underestimate what a bunch of plucky individuals <laughs> can do uh, to change the world because the truth <laughs> the truth is that the only people who actually ever have and you know you've you've changed something here just by documenting it it's it's like the heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle you know whatever you observe you also change mhm mhm oh yeah exactly yeah mhm uh yeah being um yeah and i did take that quite seriously that role of of not putting my my ego and my own um personality into that but just sort of letting the observation and and what was happening sort of take um precedence and that's why i think it's um it's kind of safe for people to watch because it's not bombastic and i'm not bombarding and uh it's just gently explaining why people were there what happened and what do we do now you know then this is a fundamental thing about being a human you know where have we come from where are we going <laughs> And where am I now? Yeah. And so that's sort of a, a very fundamental question. That, that is at the bottom of all religion, really, and all um, stories that we tell ourselves. And as you say, it's all stories. So we have to tell some good stories, right? And positive stories that are going to take us to vision into the future. Manifest our, you know, I don't know, I believe this whole manifesting so much, but I do believe that we need to tell great stories to connect us because that's what is connecting us as a story and work on that together and that's the way forward uh, that's why i would not say it's revolution it's actually a better story yeah. uh, so watch river of freedom story <laughs> <laughs> so uh every hero uh in a story has this uh thing that they call the inciting incident Uh, For Luke Skywalker, it was seeing his uh, uh, uncle and aunt uh, burnt to death by uh, stormtroopers. And I believe that for a lot of people, that Wellington protest uh, and specifically the the brutal police uh, uh, treatment of them and the uh, extraordinary uh, lies that were told uh, throughout the media who have become the arbiters of disinformation rather than the ones who point it out, they are the examples of it. That was probably... In, in no small part an inciting incident for the lives of many many of our future heroes it is said that there are only two paths to immortality through reproduction your children you pass on your genes you pass on your wisdom you pass on your knowledge and the other path to immortality 
is through narrative. Mm. And this is how we, in part, especially as uh, filmmakers, as artists, uh, if we, we strive our entire lives to create something that truly transcends time so that part of us may live forever to benefit those who may never meet us, who may never hug us, who may never love us, can still take something mm. and be given something from us. Nice, yeah. The immortal Gaylene Barnes, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> from the R River of Freedom. Thank you uh, so much for your time. Uh, it's been my, uh, my great honour and pleasure to uh, speak with you today. Thank you so much. It's really been fun. And, you know, all the best with what you're doing too, eh? Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to need it. Um, and... We have, uh, of course, uh, just a tiny little a bit of housekeeping uh, to do before we uh, leave the show today. Again, just a reminder, riveroffreedom.nz is the website, uh, ladies and gentlemen, where you can buy the movie on Blu-ray for 45 New Zealand dollars. What's that, like 30 bucks US or something of that nature? Are you shipping internationally? Uh, yes, yep, yep. Yep, I have an international um, fee there. It just covers it. <laughs> okay, excellent. So uh, that'll be a, a good one for people, even if you're uh, overseas or doing that. And, and also another thing, license a screening. Could you explain that one a little bit? Well, obviously, um, we made a, a feature film. So we have a amazing 2K DCP, you know, what, which is what they project in the cinemas. You know, 5.1 sound, it's a theatrical um amazing experience in the cinema so um if any um of your listeners wants to organize a cinema screening in their town or their cinema bring people together because that's ideally what we wanted is rather than just watching it online in your loneliness of your room <laughs> you know you can go out and watch it in the cinema and have some popcorn and share an ice cream with people so uh yeah so we're still doing that but you know because it's online maybe people don't necessarily want to do that but um it we have, because we have sold, well, not sold, but we're going to like given <laughs> distribution rights to uh, this company in London, Journeyman Pictures, who have been really amazing and helped us heaps. Um, they will organise a screening for, um, yeah, if, it, if you could like a whole theatrical release in the USA, would be amazing, wouldn't it? Oh, wow. All right. Well, uh, if the producer's listening uh, at Ground Zero Radio, uh, have a sort of, sort of uh, contact or, or wish to do that. I, who knows? You know, it's what, what do they say? The uh, the old African saying: How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Right. With uh, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, back to the ha housekeeping. The Vinnie Eastwood Show dot com is a, a gargantuan uh, a, a source of information ladies and gentlemen you can just search on here david ike mark passio or jordan maxwell uh, you know uh, any of these uh, old school people g edward griffin if you, if you don't know these names you should and if you haven't listened to a conversation with the vinnie eastwood show you should all right, there's, there's something my uh, guitarist told me once. He says he, he did an experiment this one time. He went and he listened to every interview with one a particular person that he could find and then listened to my interview with them. It was better. <laughs> All right. Why? Because we have fun. Why? Because we go deep. This is what it's all about. It's not an interview. It's a conversation. It's when you're free to be yourself, you relax. And that relaxes you, the audience. And if you are having fun, the audience will too. That's what it is, ladies and gentlemen. Just because you're being exterminated by ruthless criminal sociopathic scumbaggery, ultra intergenerational uh, wealth families and child trafficking Satanists doesn't mean you can't have fun, okay? That's a very important lesson that I hope everybody understands. Trench humor. When you have bombs going off all around you and when you're being 
flooded with mustard gas, and you're being shot at, and you're in hip deep mud. You need to tell a few jokes to get you through the day, okay? And figuratively, that is what we all deal with on a daily basis. I know. I've been there. You did that, didn't you? You went, oh, oh my god, it's so, it's so horrible, the cacophony of scumbaggery. You know, and, and bro, I understand, okay? We all go through that process where we grieve the loss of the lies we were told and told ourselves and believed and lived. We all <laughs> grieve it. It is time for them to end. All things must end. And that's what the show is about. To help you end that life that wasn't real. And give you a conversation with people who are really being themselves so that you can be encouraged to be yourself too and this comes into the uh, 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 final question you know oh, okay well well Vinny, you know you're telling me about life purpose and what, whatever what do you think about that and uh, my answer to that is one time I got asked by an American uh, talk radio couple so Vinny, give it to us straight is the earth Check flat oh that's a uh, tuning into the live stream there darling uh <laughs> is the earth flat or is it round and i said uh, well i think it's a holographic fractal that's being projected by collective consciousness experiencing itself subjectively and they were like Whoa. How this works is there's these layers of reality. They're immutable. They're true. They were true when the universe began. They'll be true uh, when it ends. All information and all existence and all matter is stored on a holographic level. The difference between this uh, data and a hard drive is if I put a picture of you on a hard drive and delete it, gone. It's deleted. You put a picture on a hologram and delete it. Whole picture's still there now. Just half the resolution. Try to delete it again. Again, whole picture still there, just half the resolution now. Nothing you create can ever really truly be forgotten. It can only really transform or become a little bit fuzzier. This is what your art is really about. And art is anything that you're inspired to do inside your head that you create and will into the three-dimensional universe. Okay, you're a fifth dimensional consciousness being. This is how you access reality. This is how you play with it. This is how you build things. And that's pretty straightforward. First dimension's a dot. Second dimension's a line. Third dimension is a box. The fourth dimension is that box moving through time. And the fifth dimension is that same box, but it's beyond time. It's beyond space. It's the past, and it is the future, and it is the now and it does not exist except in your head until you spend your fourth dimensional time willing that idea into the three-dimensional universe that way other people can see it smell it taste it touch it and use it and that will trigger their own fifth dimensional ideas every artist has seen art before they became an artist every musician has heard a song before they decided to become a musician a filmmaker watched movies before becoming a filmmaker we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams and everything that we create goes into the hologram and can never be forgotten that's how important your every day and your every work actually is it's great umbrage with which you must approach it because of its obli obligatory nature. You, you don't have a choice to create your art. You are obliged to, because each day that you do not, you will become resentful of those who do. And it works on a fractal scale, as I was saying before about the cells and the uh, psychopaths and the uh, free radicals. Everything is just a larger or smaller version of something else. To you, uh, the planet, the galaxy, the universe, 
It's different scales of life that are living together. Even the universe is probably a cell in the body of a much larger organism we don't have a word for yet. Now, everything is conscious as well. These guys did this double slit experiment where they had these uh, two metal slots and they would shoot a proton gun, or a photon gun rather, and it would hit this aluminium foil behind it. What they figured would happen is it would just go bang, bang, and they'd figure out how the particle exploded, but it didn't. It went bang, and turned into a waveform, and they were like, whoa, that's cool. Let's put a camera right in the slot there and see what, how, that, how that happened. Bang, bang. Oh my god! The particle reacted differently because it was being watched. It knew that it was being observed. It it got stage fright. <laughs> uh, uh, great, greater or lesser degrees, but it is consciousness none the less. And we're experiencing it subjectively collective consciousness being personified i am collective consciousness experiencing uh, uh, the meat suit of vinnie eastwood uh, uh, more or less and we all exist because existence itself wanted us here in order for itself to feel complete you complete the fabric of reality every day with the things that you dream up and manifest into it you're very special you're very important just like everybody else so you're not really unique in that what is unique is how exactly you see the world and what you do to make it better Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much all the people in the chat room who have ignored during the entire broadcast. <laughs> You've got people who've been listening to the show for, for like uh, over a decade. Um, and they still uh, listen to the show, and they're still in, in the chat rooms, and they're still so beautiful. Gu guys, I've, I've met so many of you, so many uh, of uh, uh, the listeners uh, on this broadcast, from this broadcast, and, 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 and all, all of that kind of thing. And I was explaining this to uh, Gaylene uh, before the show, is that you've, you've got uh, attributes in common with each other. You're reasonably intelligent, for one. You've got a sense of humor. You've got skills, actual real skills. You can make things. And you've got interesting stories, and you've got trauma in your past. This is the way in which we all are. It's like my producer said, again, all artists are broken people. But it's the broken things that build the world thank you so much we'll see you again sometime at the vinnie eastwood show dot com attention all